Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Uh, today we'll take a look at Villa Moller by Adolf Loss in Residential Masterpieces number 25, published by GA. Villa Moller and Villa Müller are two houses designed by Adolf Loss in his later years that are, despite their difference in size and budget, definitely sister houses. Through these houses he implemented to the full extent his round plan, a unique architectural method later named so by his disciple Kulka. The round plan was different from the conventional architectural design method which consisted of first creating two-dimensional planes, then specializing them by expanding them in vertical directions. It was an innovative way of organizing designing that consists of sequences of spaces drawn in three dimensions. Cluster of spaces thus come to be placed on various levels as rooms. A ceiling level is sometimes shared with a number of spaces. At other times, spaces placed at different levels in proximity are each given totally different significance or relationship by being connected through stairs. Size, proportion, coloring, materials, features, finish and lighting assigned to each space make it singular, while such spaces interact with one another to eventually create as a whole a new type of architectural experience. Moreover, effective combination of such spaces turned them into a piece of architecture, implying new possibilities in terms of both effective usability and economic efficiency of space. As if they were a series of caverns of various sizes that emerged underground, these spaces with their ever-changing directions, heights and widths account for the richness of experience. On the other hand, round plan is a design method that is hard to be visualized or formulated into a theorem. Compared to, for instance, the clear up of five points of a new architecture advocated by Le Corbusier, round plan was not subject to generalization and was seldom accomplished in reality. What is more, in order to put this method to actual use, the designer needs to have design abilities as well as high levels of spatial sensibility and perception, in addition to encountering inevitable discontinuity and complexity issues in realizing the structure. Eventually, it never succeeded to propagate itself as a modernist theorem. Round plan and laws came to be widely reconsidered after the war, from the 1980s onward with the rise of postmodernism. Together with the potentials of round plan, Law's eclectic approach provided many architects and scholars with clues for the demodernization of the time, as they reverted back in reconsideration after half a century. The two masterpieces featured in this book were both built before World War II. The subsequent violent tides of time allowed the clients to enjoy the richness of their spaces for only a short period of time. Today, these houses miraculously look as they were at the time of completion and carry the potentials of Adolf Law's round plan for the future generations. Villa Moller was completed three years earlier than Villa Müller. Although smaller in scale and different in terms of construction cost compared to Villa Müller, this house was also based on round plan, with a drama of spatial sequence that is similar to Villa Müller in terms of quality that is developed within the building. The house for the textile industrialist Hans Moller and his wife Annie, who studied bookbinding at the Bauhaus in Germany, was built in a residential area on the outskirts of Vienna. Bordered by a street on its northern side, the site is elongated towards south. The house is built beyond a small front yard on the north. On the south is a large elongated garden. With an almost square elevation, the north facade features symmetric openings and volume composition that look like an abstracted human face. On the other hand, the southern elevation features a terrace facing the dining room and balcony for the upper floor bedrooms protruding toward the garden. From the street that slopes from east to west, access to the house is through a gate and the small front yard. 
The entrance is arranged in the center of the facade, with a volume protruding from the wall above that consists of a bay window and the terrace of upper floors that play the role of eaves for the entrance. The small entrance hall has a relatively high ceiling and is lit by a horizontal window above the door. Behind the entrance hall are the garage and various rooms for the housekeepers. Guests do not stay on this floor and move on to take the stairs on the right hand side and climb to the landing half a floor up where the clock room is and the floor heights is low. This landing is a space of scene transition connecting the entrance hall and the living room above, emphasizing the characteristics of both spaces. At the landing, the stairs take a 180 degree turn, then a few other 90 degrees as they climb up. At the top of the stairs is the living room, main hall. On the south of the ladder is a music room separated by a sliding door. On the east of the music room is the dining room. The living room is divided into two levels. Five steps uh, the stairs on north is an alcove that is the aforementioned bay window above the entrance. A view over the garden is afforded from the alcove through the music room and the window. On the west side of the alcove is the library. Inside the library are built-in bookshelves within a calm setting. The music room where Mr. Moller enjoyed playing music has walls finished with okume veneer and the lines of ceiling luminaries uh, along the walls that emphasize the room's boundary. On the north wall is arranged a pair of built-in shelves. On the wall facing the garden on the south are arranged in a symmetric manner a pair of built-in sofas and windows behind them on both sides of a glass door in the middle which offers access to the garden. Connected to the music room is the dining room whose floor is four steps higher than the former while the ceiling heights of both rooms are the same, hence its floor height kept lower than the music room. Between the music room and the dining room is a retractable sliding door that can be open and closed depending on the use. At the time of completion, the stairs that we now see between the music room and the dining room did not exist, except for narrow retractable stairs in the center. Some of the pictures taken at the time of completion show the absence of furniture in the dining room, suggesting that people might have sat directly on the carpet. Whether or not this is indicative of an influence of Japanese architecture is unclear, might be an influence of relationship among continuous spaces that can be seen, for instance, between sashiki, Japanese style drawing room, and doma, earthen floor. As with the music room, dining room walls are symmetric in composition. The northern wall features a built-in cupboard in the center and a pair of doors on both sides, arranged in a classic manner. The door on the left opens to the staircase that climbs up to the living room and the bedroom floor located adjacent to the ladder, while the door on the right leads to the kitchen. The southern wall has a large opening to introduce light and give access to the adjacent terrace. The staircase, situated between the living room and the kitchen, continues up to the bedroom floor. A group of five bedrooms, including the master bedroom, is arranged around a central corridor that stretches east to west. Farther up is the rooftop terrace, which can be accessed by a small spiral stairway tucked beside the staircase. Facing the north side of the rooftop terrace are two bedrooms, one of which being used as the ladies' bookbinding atelier. From the rooftop terrace one can fully enjoy the view over the garden. Here ends the chain of spaces that started off at the entrance. Texts and photographs are by Yoshio Futagawa. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.